This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to share with you a prayer I always say when I come to church silently, whether I'm reading the gospel or, or preaching. Lord, set me on fire to preach your word and then send them to watch me burn for love of you. <laughs> Don't you like that? Oh yeah. I say it all the time. So as always, we have challenging scriptures before us today. We are at a point in, in Matthew's story that Jesus, where things are getting pretty tense. Earlier in the week, Jesus had entered Jerusalem and been greeted by an adoring crowds. Riding this wave of popular claim, he immediately enters the temple and overthrows the tables of the money changers challenging both the political and the religious powers. Confronted by the religious leaders regarding the authority behind his actions, Jesus tells several provocative, even threatening parables, calling into question their own authority and indeed standing before God. Today we heard about two groups that normally had little to do with each other. The Herodians derive their power from the Roman occupiers, while the Pharisees align more closely with the occupied and oppressed commoners, declare a temporary truce in order to work together to trap Jesus. The question they pose is beyond clever, asking Jesus whether it was lawful to pay the imperial tax that funded Roman occupation. Should Jesus answer in the positive, the crowds would likely not simply evaporate, evaporate, but rather be turned into opposition. Should he answer negatively, then he will be positioned himself over and against the Romans, and never a wise thing to do. So they have him trapped, or so they think. Jesus asks those whose image is on the coin, and the answer, the, the emperor's. There is more going on here than meets the eye, because with that a, image is an engraved confession of Caesar's divinity, which means that any Jew holding the coin is breaking the first two commandments, all of which G, leads to Jesus' closing line. Give, therefore, to the emperor the things that are his, and to God the things that are God's. And with one sentence, Jesus not only simply evades their trap and confronts their, and confounds their plans, but issues a challenge to his hearers that is reflected through the ages into our sanctuaries now. I was reminded of the opening chapter in Genesis. Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Now let us pause for a minute and th think about that and allow that to sink in. Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. We are made in the image and the likeness of God. And because we bear God's likeness, we are to act like God. We are not gods, those who lord authority over others for self-gain, but rather we are like God, the one who creates and sustains and nurtures and redeems and saves, no matter what the cost. We are called to serve as God's agents, God's partners, and God's co-workers, exercising dominion over creation, not as an act of power, but rather as an act of stewardship and extending to all abundant life God wishes for us all. Well, since it's October, stewardship is a good thing to say, right? But I'm talking about a different kind of stewardship, the stewardship of who we are in our likeness to God. Notice that the dispute in the, the fact that Jesus' opponents carry a coin with a graven image and the confession of uh, Caesar's divinity 
Jesus doesn't accuse them of blasphemy or disloyalty. Rather, he calls them hypocrites, those who have quietly literally taken to wear another and false likeness. So perhaps the charge against those trying to entrap or discount Jesus then or now is best understood as amnesia, for they have forgotten who they were, in those in whose likeness they were made too. They were made too. Paul's words to the Thessalonians, let us hear this again. Brothers and sisters, beloved of God, that he has chosen you, that's you and that's me, because our message of the gospel came not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. It goes on to say, become imitators of us and the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you can be an example to all believers. Amen. Amen. I trained you well, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> but listen, if you, as you listen to that, what a great reputation they had in, in Thessalonians. What a great reputation they had. And with that great reputation, there came a great influence, an ability to move the hearts and the minds of many and give praise to God and to live a more godly and holy life. Once again, Scripture and life challenges us to ask ourselves difficult questions, both individually and as a faith community. Are we a people who can make a difference in the world? a people known for our faith in the living God. What is our reputation in the community as a, as a community of faith and individually? What's our reputation? The difficult questions are meant to remind and awaken us that we are made in the image of God. We are chosen of God. Yesterday when I was sitting there and nothing was coming and I'm going, oh my God, Lord, please. <laughs> you know, nothing is coming here. I'm just sitting here. I'm looking at the screen and I got real quiet and just sat there and I just heard Jesus say, you are chosen and you can do this. And that's all I needed to hear. <laughs> and I just felt this peace that rushed through me. I had to be reminded too that I am chosen and made in the image of God. In 1 Peter, it says, We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that we may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called us out of darkness into the marvelous light. Amen. Amen. It's great if we're known for our hospitality and our warmth. It's not even so bad if we are known for our beautiful sanctuary. But it's far better to be known for our faith, for what we do in faith to show our love for God and for one another. After all, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are a city built on a hill which cannot be hidden. Isn't that right? I read of a 30-story building in a large city that was built some years ago. It was written up in a magazine because uh, the 30-story building was built and completed in a matter of a few weeks. It was quite a feat. But when the building project manager was asked about this building marvel, he told of the many weeks it took to build the foundation. He said the taller the building, the deeper the foundation, the taller the building, the deeper the foundation. And so it is with the church. The foundation is who? Jesus Christ. Is there anybody else here? <laughs> Amen. The, Amen. <laughs> the foundation is Jesus Christ. 
When we build our lives in Christ, when we anchor ourselves by faith to the power of his word and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, then we cannot help but become strong. And even in the face of persecution, we can't help but shine. Even when it's dark, we can't help but be the salt that preserves the world. We can be the people who proclaim the mighty acts of God and lead others to a life in Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, faith in God sees the invisible, believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. We serve a God who delights in the impossibilities. God isn't looking for great people, but he is looking for people who will realize the greatness of God. Faith puts God between us and our circumstances. Faith is not a leap into the dark. It's a leap out of the darkness into the light. We learn to believe by faith, not by sight. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Bob. It's so nice to hear your voice in here. Woo! As I was writing this out, I, I thought of the story of a boy who was flying a kite and a passerby looking up to the sky and not able to see the kite because it was, of its height asked him, what are you doing? Well, I'm flying a kite. Well, how do you know it, where it is? You can't see it. I can feel the tug of the string. Perhaps we can't see God like you and me here present. But we can feel the tug of conviction that he puts in our hearts and in our being. And we can go on in faith, believing his promises. Each of us is a one-of-a-kind story through which Jesus seeks to reveal himself. Our life and our story is important. And how we live it out is vital, is vital. And I think we come here to be reminded of that every Sunday, don't we? Every time I read scripture, I'm more and more convicted, convinced that we are called to live that holy life. And as far as I know, there are no exceptions. But what does that mean to live a holy life? I believe that holiness must be more than just a concept in our mind. It's more than coming to church and raising our hands during worship that makes us feel warm and fuzzy. It's about what happens outside these walls, outside this place of worship. Our living is to be holy. Our moments of pain, our moments of joy, and our efforts to live life to the fullest can be holy. He knows our humanity. He knows that we will fall, that we will make mistakes. He's not asking us to be perfect. But he is saying, you are my child. Stand up, brush yourself off, and let's go again. As Abraham Heschel once said so beautifully, just to be is a blessing. Just to have been given life, the breath of life, and live is holy. Isn't that awesome? It's awesome. I'd like to end with a passage from Micah 6, one of my favorites, which I say every day. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. And God's people said, Amen. And I'd like us to have a few moments of silence just to take that in, that you are a chosen vessel of God. <laughs> 